Hello everyone, in the lecture today we will start the introduction about the pavement mechanics which will be applied for both flexible and rigid pavements. In this lecture we will focus on the analysis of the stress and strain in the flexible pavements. Before we start the introduction about the analysis of the stress and strain in the flexible pavement, we need to ask three questions. The first one is what the problems are. Basically, in this lecture, we want to find out the estimation about the stress and the strain for the flexible pavement and the different traffic structure and weather conditions. The second question we want to ask is, uh, what should we know from the analysis? Basically, we want to identify how the different layers in the flexible pavement will interact with each other. Also, we need to estimate the displacement or the deformation and the maximum stress in the subgrades below the pavement structures. Moreover, we want to check whether the stress or the strain levels of the current design are well below the failure conditions so that the structure can sustain for a longer time. This will lead to the third question. What do we need to know? to solve these questions in the second one. First, we want to have the suitable series to identify the values, including the estimation of the stress and the strain and the flexible pavement and also the relationships for different layers. Second, we want to define some reasonable parameters which can be easily obtained from the lab and field experiments. Finally, we need to identify the failure criteria for the flexible pavement, which will be used for us to identify the upper bounds of the set of the variables and parameters. Generally, the objective of the analysis is predicting the stresses, strain, and deformation induced by the traffic loads and environmental factors to the flexible pavement. And this analysis is very important because we know that the stresses, strain, and deformation will cause some distresses to the flexible pavement structures, such as the rotting, fatigue cracking, top-down cracking, and so on. And this one is directly related to the functional failure or the structural failures of the flexible pavements. Based on the topics we introduced in the previous lectures, we can identify that there are three major factors we have to consider for the pavement design. Traffic and loading, environmental consideration, and materials. The stress and the strain analysis will be applied for us to identify the failure criteria of the pavement under these three factors. In general, there are two types of pavements, flexible pavement and rigid pavements. The flexible pavement will usually apply the asphalt contents as the pavement materials, while the Poland cement concrete is applied for the rigid pavement. The stress distribution behind the pavement structure will actually be very different, even with the same traffic load applied on the surface for flexible and rigid pavements. Usually for the rigid pavements, the load will be spread it over a large area, which is defined by the size of the PCC slab. And uh, in that sense, the stress distribution will be more uniform and uh, the pressure applied to the subgrade will be very low. While for the flexible pavement, the distribution of the stress is more concentrated and there will be a much higher stress applied to the subgrade layer. So these two types of the pavement will have very different stress distributions and their analysis will be very different. We will do the analysis for these two kinds of pavement separately in the future lectures. The analysis of the stress and strain is related to the response of the pavement materials. For the flexible pavement, we usually assume that the response is dominated by the asphalt contents. And the figure here shows the distribution of the stress behind the surface of the pavement. Usually for the flex pavement, there are multiple layers and each one with different materials. We need to analyze the layered system behaviors to identify the distribution of the stress and the strain. 
RSO for the flexible payments, all the layers will carry part of the load instead of all the loads. While for the rigid payment, we have to consider the concrete response, which will be the slab action respect to the load applied to the payment. And uh, for the rigid payment, the slab will carry all or most of the load applied to the payment. The figure on the left shows the response of the payment structure and the subgrade to the load applied to the flexible payment. Basically, you can see that for the point directly behind the tire, we will have the compression applied to the pavement structure. And for the points before and after the direct contact region, the tension will be applied to the pavement structure. For the subgrade, the reaction will be very different. For the point behind the tire, there will be some tension applied, while for the points before and after, we will have the compressions. The tension and compression identified in the previous page is very important for the design of the flexible pavement, and they could be applied for us to identify the tensile stress and vertical stress applied to the asphalt concrete layer and the subgrade. Actually, the tensile stress at the bottom of the AC layer is very important for us to identify the fatigue cracking. Usually for the tensile strain generated by the tensile stress should be less than 70 microstrain. Here mu epsilon equals to 10 to the power of minus 6 meter per meter. It's one unit for us to identify this strain. The vertical stress at the top of the subgrid soil is also very important. This one is related to the structure rotting. Usually the vertical strain should be less than 200 microstrain. Moreover, the tensions applied to the permanent structure will generate two types of cracking. For the tension applied to the bottom of the permanent structure, the bottom up cracking will be generated, which is also called the fatigue cracking. The cracks will be formed at the bottom of the pavement and propagate upward to the surface. Also, we know that the load on the flexible pavement will generate the tensions at the surface of the pavement, and they will be part of the reason for the top-down cracking, where the cracks will be generated from the surface of the pavement to the bottom. However, the mechanism of the top-down cracking is not fully understood yet. From the field observation, we can find that most top-down cracking occurs in thick asphalt concrete layer, and usually it happens within three to five years of the construction. And for most of the time, the top-down cracking is longitudinal, and the surface cracking width it's between 3 to 4 millimeters and it's decreasing with the depth. Also, the total cracking depth can range from about 25 millimeters to 50 millimeters. However, as we stated previously, the mechanism of this cracking is not well understood yet. Traffic and loading is one of the most important factors we have to consider for pavement design. In the previous topic, we have already introduced the estimation of traffic and loading. Well, we need to consider the real loads with respect to axial and the vehicle loads, tile pressure and the contact area, land distribution of trucks, number of the load applications and their sequence, and the vehicle speed or traffic speed. Usually, the estimation about the traffic and loading for the flexible pavement should start from the single wheel load analysis, and then we will consider the estimation of the single axle load, and then we will focus on the single truck 
and uh, estimate the truck traffic and then eventually we will find out the value of ESAL and this one will be directly applied for the structural design of the pavements. There are two factors for us to model the single wheel load to the pavements. The first one is the contact pressure. Usually the contact pressure is defined as the value equal to the inflation pressure of tires. And we usually assume that the pressure is uniformly distributed on the contact area. The second factor is called the loaded area, which is also the contact area of the tire to the pavement. For the flexible pavement, the loaded area is circular. For the rigid pavement, it is assumed as rectangular. The contact area for the flexible and rigid pavements can be estimated based on the load and the pressure applied to the pavement. For the flexible pavement, assuming that the wheel load is a capital P and the contact pressure, which is defined as the tire pressure Q, then the contact area will be defined by the equation here, that is P over Q. For the flexible pavement, we define the contact area, which is the loaded area, as in the circle. With that, we can find out the radius of the circle as a equal to the square root of p over pi times q. For the rigid pavement, the contact area is in the triangle and the width of the triangle is 0.6L, the length is 0.8712L. Then by the definition of the contact area, the value of L in this rectangle can be identified as square root of P over 0.5227 times Q. So that's the definitions about the contact areas for the flexible and rigid pavements based on the given wheel load and the tire pressure. There are many methods proposed for the analysis of the stress and the strain for flexible pavements. Basically, it can be categorized into three types, the analytical solution, multi-layer elastic theory, and the finite element method. In this class, we will focus on the analytical solution. Usually, there are three types of the analytical solutions, and they will be differentiated based on the number of layers they considered. The first one is a homogeneous method, where we consider the whole pavement structure as one layer. The second one is a Burmester theory, which will be applied for the two-layered structure. The third one is the Audemars procedure. It can be applied for multi-layer pavement structures. First, let's have a brief introduction about the multi-layer elasticity theory for the analysis of the stress and strain. In this theory, we assume that each layer has homogeneous and isotropic properties, which means the material properties of the, each layer is a constant. With that, for the analysis, we will assume that the modulus of elasticity and the Poisson's ratio in each layer will be the same at different locations. Also, for the subgrade, we assume that it's a semi-infinite, and for the pavement layers, they will have the finite thickness. For example, for the first layer, the thickness is H1, while for the subgrade, we know the uh, top of the subgrade layer, but we do not specify the bottom of the layer. In addition, for the pavement layer, they are assumed to have the infinite lateral dimensions, so they could be extended to infinite lateral distance. Moreover, we assume that 
four frictions will be applied between their layers. So we have the clear boundaries between layers. Finally, we assume that there isn't any shear force applied at the surface of the pavement. So we will only have the load applied to the pavement structure perpendicularly. The figure on the right simplifies the pavement structure for the analysis of the stress and strain. For the flexible pavement, we know that the contact area is a circle and the radius is set as A. Also, we know the contact pressure, which is similar to the tile pressure and is set as Q. For the flexible pavement, we will have multiple layers and we know the property of each layer and the property in each layer will be constant. Here, we are given the modulus of elasticity and the Poisson's ratio. In addition, we know the thickness or the depth of the pavement layer. And this information will be applied for us to estimate the stress and the strain. Figure here shows the stress and the strain applied to the point A behind the surface of the pavement. The depth of the point A is set as Z. And the distance from point A to the center line of the contact area is defined as R. And then in this figure, sigma Z is the vertical stress. Sigma T is the um, tangential stress. Sigma R is the radial stress. We also have the value of tau RZ and tau ZR, which are defined as the shear stress. With the values of these uh, three stresses, vertical stress, tangential stress, and radial stress, we can identify the strain. The vertical strain epsilon z is defined as 1 over z times sigma z minus mu times sigma r plus sigma t. Here, mu is the Poisson's ratio. And E is the modulus of elasticity. Similarly, we can find out the radial strain as epsilon r in the second equation and tangential strain epsilon t. In addition, we are also able to find out the relationship between the resilient modulus with respect to the box stress and divider stress as the one we showed in the previous lectures. And for a lot of situations, we assume that the modulus of elasticity is the same to the resilient modulus. In addition, the Burmester method is actually one special case of the multi-layer elasticity. And uh, it's actually one simplification about the multi-layer elasticity theory. In the multi-layer elasticity theory, the estimations of the vertical tangential and radial stresses and strain are very complicated. It's very difficult to find out their values analytically. In that sense, we need to recall some results from the lab and the field experiment. The figure here shows the relationship between the depths of the point we want to measure and the vertical stress. Basically, the vertical axis represents the 
ratio between the depths and the radius of the contact area. And the horizontal axis shows the ratio between the vertical stress and the contact pressure. In this figure, each line represents the result for one value of the ratio between R over A. Here, R is the distance from the point to the center line. And you can find out the value of the vertical stress based on the depth and the distance of the point to the center line. The figure here shows the relationship between the depth of the point and the radial stress. Similarly, in this figure, each line represents one value about the ratio of R over A. Also, we have the relationship between the depth and the tangential stress. And this figure shows the relationship between the depth and the shear stress. Similarly, each line represents one value of R over A. This figure shows the relationship between the depth and the coefficient applied for the estimation of the vertical deflection, F. Uh, with the value of F, we can find out the vertical deflection as Q times A over E times F. Here, omega is the vertical deflection. In the multi-layer elasticity theory, we assume that the modulus of elasticity is constant for each layer. And the table here summarizes the typical elastic modular for different materials. Basically, you can see that the PCC has the highest modulus of elasticity, which is around 300,000 megapascal, while the CLT and the clay soils will have the lowest modulus of elasticity. In the analysis of the stress and the strain with the multi-layer elasticity theory, we also need to use the Poisson's ratio. The table here shows the typical and the range of the Poisson's ratio for different materials. Now let's check one example to see how we can apply the multi-layer elasticity theory for the estimation of the stress and strain. In this example, we are considering the payment showing the figure here. It's in a homogeneous half space pavement layer subject to two circular loads. The diameter of each one is 10 inches and the space between these two loads is 20 inches. And the pressure on the circular areas is 50 psi. The half space has an elastic modulus of 10,000 psi and the Poisson ratio is 0.5. It wants us to determine the vertical stress, strain, and deflection at point A. Point A is actually located 10 inches below the center of one circle. Now, in order to find out the stress and strain, we have to consider the impact of the two loads separately. A is uh, directly behind one load and uh, it's actually on the left side of the second one. In the solution, let's first consider the stress caused by the load on the left. For the load on the left, if we consider the location of point A, we will have Z equal to 10 inches, R equal to 0, as A is located in the center line of the load. Also, we have A, which is the radius of the contact area, it's 10 over 2, that is 
5 inches as the diameter is 10 inches and the contact pressure Q equal to 50 psi we also have the common values modulus of elasticity as 10,000 psi and uh, Poisson's ratio 0.5 with that we can find out the ratio of z over a as 2 and r over a as 0 then we can find out the value of the vertical stress radial stress and tangential stress from the figures that we showed in the previous pages with the depth ratio as 2 and the value of r over a as 0 based on that we can find sigma z over q equal to 0.28 that is uh, sigma z equal to 14.0 psi similarly for sigma r over q equal to 0.016 with that we have sigma r equal to 0.8 PSI. We also have the sigma t over q equal to 0 0.016 and that is uh, sigma t equal to 0 0.8 PSI. In addition, we can find out the factor for the deflection capital F as 0.68 and this will be used for us to estimate the vertical deflection now let's check the stress caused by the load on the right for the load on the right similarly we will have z equal to 10 inches for the point a and r is different R is actually the distance from the point A to the center line of the load. In this case, it's 20 inches. And uh, the other values will be the same to the load on the left. With that, we have Z over A equal to 2 and R over A equal to 4. And with these two values, we can then identify sigma z over q equal to 0 0.0076, and it gives us the value of sigma z as 0.38 psi. Also, we have sigma r over q equal to 0 0.026 and we have sigma r as 1.3 psi we find that sigma t over q is approximately zero and give us sigma t as zero and now we can combine the stress we estimated from these two loads together. With that, we have sigma z equal to 14.0 plus 0.38, that is 14.38 psi. Sigma R equal to 
0.8 plus 1.3 equal to 2.1 psi and uh, sigma t equal to 0.8 plus 0 equal to 0.8 psi and then we can recall the relationship between the stress and strain to identify the vertical strain for the vertical strain we have epsilon z equal to 1 over e times sigma z minus mu sigma r plus sigma t here we know that e is a 10,000 mu is a 0.5 and we have the value of sigma z sigma r and sigma t then we can calculate the vertical strain as 0.00129 so that's the way for us to find out the combined vertical stress and the vertical strain the last thing we want to estimate is the deflection so for the deflection we need to find out the value of the combined F um, from the load on the left we find the value of F as 0.68 and uh, for the load on the right by using the value of z over r and r over a we can find the value of f as 0.21 then the combined factor will be 0.89 with that we can find out the vertical deflection as Q times A over E times F. Q is a 50, A is a 5, E is a 10,000, F is a 0.89. And we can find out the vertical deflection as 0 0.022 inches so with that we find out all the variables we want to estimate in the example the vertical stress is a 14.38 vertical strain as 0 0.00129 and the vertical deflection is 0 0.022 inches so that's all about the lecture today thank you very much for your attention in the next lecture we will continue this topic